Next, we give Barry King a full, in-depth hearing. In this section, we simply let King speak. Right. Okay, I'm Barry King. I'm a, a UFO researcher. I've been researching the subject for 30 years now. Over the last two years, I've been producing some documents called The Voice. This details an NSA-run mass mind manipulation program in this country. This program also involves microchipping individuals, genetic engineering and experimentation, and is run from a base deep in the Berkshire countryside. I've been involved with this program for a number of years now. In fact, I was first inducted in 1972. I worked at the base, uh, which is located underground at Peasmore in Berkshire, so as a security officer. What sort of duties did that include? Uh, the, the main duties as a security officer then were to patrol the premises. Uh, you're overseeing goods in and out. Goods I use in a loose term because obviously we're not going to know what uh, sort of goods they're going to be. Um, basically, all all the usual um, security operations. What size of base is this? Well, when I was there. The complex itself was approximately 450 yards by 650 yards, but obviously since then it's probably uh, doubled in size. And how many levels? Uh, six levels, they were the main levels. And how far would they be down underground? The deepest point would have been about a mile. Um, I only had access to a certain amount of information, so I only know about those six levels. So, starting from scratch, how did you get involved with the base? Well, I was sort of manoeuvred into uh, working there as opposed to just being a guinea pig like uh, many thousands of others. So it was a, a manoeuvred um, opportunity by the NSA to get me into the base where they could keep an eye on me as well as to actually uh, take part in the security procedures. So did you apply to the Ministry of Defence? Or? Oh no, no, no. Um, I was approached direct by the controllers of the programme. Why? I mean, why did your name come out of the hat? Did you win the Reader's Digest competition? It, that would have been a nice way around it. No, I was also um, a participant in a government-run survey um, since I was a child. This survey is ongoing. And by 1972, when the survey actually started to link hand in hand, if you like, with the programme, uh, I was monitored very closely from 72 onwards, so by 79. By, by who? The, the survey is run um, by the governments of three main countries, that's the UK, the USA and Canada. This survey is actually run from Harwell, who have very close links, as I said, with Peasmore. What sort of links do Har does Harwell have with Peasmore? Uh, because a lot of genetic engineering and experimentation takes place, obviously Harwell is um, the main place of the server. They have direct links because the guinea pigs that are taken to Peasmore and used for um, experimentation engineering, there's obviously a direct link with Harwell and a number of other establishments, such as Portland Down. And where else? Uh, Watchfield, over in uh, Oxfordshire, um, the science, the military science place over there. Green and Common is also linked, so is Boscombe Down. Boscombe Down is used mainly for the import and export of the hardware yeah. used by the programme. What sort of hardware are they dealing with then? Well, we're talking here, the hardware is actually um, super stealth type aircraft. So, altogether quite normal technology? I wouldn't use the word but normal secret, technology. Secret, but advanced? Very advanced. I mean, some of the machinery they've got is uh, advanced to a level where you could say that certainly uh, an alien uh, technology was involved at one stage. So, why would that suggest? I mean, surely we're pretty intelligent ourselves. When we're talking in terms of the technology that people have had a glance at over at uh, Groom Lake, Area 51. It's that sort of technology we're talking about. The hardware used is the hardware being tested at Groom Lake. It's been tested here in the UK since 
the mid 60s. I mean, they used areas uh, around Salisbury Plain in the 60s, hence all the reports around Warminster at the time. Yeah. That was the hardware being tested. So what kind of hardware are we, are we talking about? Flying discs, alien uh, spacecraft, uh, Rob Lazar type stuff? Well, not s an, an a sport I, I, model. Well, I couldn't go as far as actually, yeah, the S4 type thing. But certainly uh, disc shaped aircraft, uh, triangular shaped aircraft. I do know for a fact that under the NATO banner, one of the hardware um, devices used since the mid 80s is a triangular craft, quite large, uh, hover capabilities, usually silent. Um, that's been test flown in many Western European countries, including Belgium. So that is our military. But that's our military, yes. They're our devices, yeah. So getting back to Harwell, what if, uh, influence or what part does that play in the programme? <sighs> Because there's a lot of genetic engineering and experimentation, let's use the word alteration and modification, perhaps a bit more like it. Is that conducted on humans? It is, yes. So how does one uh, actually realise that or know it? Uh, you don't actually realise you're part of, pro of the programme or the survey. Um, most participants in the survey uh, are active from early childhood. You undergo more medical checkups, more x rays, more blood tests. You are taken to various establishments, usually Harwell itself, that's the main one, and you are monitored biologically, medically throughout your life. As I say, this is ongoing. So, what's the, what key factor are they looking for? I think what they're trying to produce in the long run is uh, a super being. So, is this derived back to the World War II experiments that Hitler did? Uh, certainly the paperclip scientists, yeah, who were captured by um, the Americans, mostly taken over to the USA, certainly that sort of experimentation has carried on since yeah, the late 40s. Yeah. So you started at this base when? I started work um, in August, September of 1979, and that carried on until about Christmas of 79. It came to a, a stage when they needed to physically uh, do something about the way I was becoming aggressive and trying to get away from the program. What and is this program? Well, this is mind manipulation, uh, genetic engineering, as I said. They use, because UFO research plays about 50% of the program's activities. They use a lot of researchers, they use psychics. Uh, they stage abductions, so that's where the military abductions come in. They actually have... So the military are doing these abductions that the aliens aren't doing? I wouldn't say the aliens aren't doing it. Obviously there is ample evidence to suggest that there are alien abductions, but certainly the military take more than their share. And this is for what purpose? Well, this is to create an image in abductees' minds that they've been abducted by um, an alien race that perhaps are more of an evil intent towards the human race than they actually are. It also gives the opportunity for the military to microchip people, to indoctrinate them via mind manipulation. They can program people's minds. Uh, they can set tasks for these people to go out and do at any given time at uh, the flick of a switch, basically. What sort of chips are you talking about? Surely they can be detected under x-ray? Not under normal x-ray, no. Um, these are very advanced, very sophisticated microchips. And depending on where they are located, there's obviously a number of locations around the body where they can be located. I have two. Where would they be? Uh, the first one was implanted behind the sternum. Right. Now that uh, doubles as a, a tracking device and a, a biological function, so they can um, monitor anyone's biological functions any time. But because that one's placed behind the sternum, it's very close to the heart, so it's, it also acts as a, 
an initiator for a cardiac arrest should the need arise to incapacitate someone. So how do you know that it happened in the past? In May of 1980, yes, they actually um, tried out the device and this resulted in a massive cardiac arrest. Uh, I was rushed to St Bart's Hospital in London and uh, yes, it could have killed me that, that uh, particular morning. Because of the power they used on that particular occasion, it left me with a, a slight depression on the left side of my chest. All right. Uh, since so 1980... Was that not picked up on the X-ray? Well, again, this is where this survey comes in. Um, all major hospitals, certainly all regional hospitals, have a computer database that any information on any patient is tapped in. And immediately it will come up on the screen if the person has any connection with the survey. Exactly um, what influence do these implants have? And surely it can be... Uh, they can be by detected by uh, CAT scans. Um, certainly... Like a brain scan? Yeah. Any, any devices, and they use quite a lot of the cranial implants, they can be detected only by CAT scans. So obviously, um, if I was to say, well, look, I want a CAT scan, it's going to cost me 450 quid, yep, I'll go and have a CAT scan and they'd pick it up. But the problem being, whatever hospital I went to have that CAT scan, it's going to go down on the records, it's going to get back to Harwell on the survey that, oh, Mr King's had a private CAT scan to detect the implant and, you know, we'd be back to square one, what would be the point? So, where is the second implant? As I say, the first one's in the sternum, the second one's in the head. And Both were. The second one, put the second one was implanted in 79 at the base. The first one in 76, I underwent a, a full program abduction. And obviously, at the time, I believed it was an alien abduction. And it wasn't until obviously uh, sometime later that I was informed it was a, a program. So how many times have you been abducted? Uh, I underwent a partial abduction in 1974 and a full abduction in 76, so it's an extra two, yeah. What do you mean by a partial abduction and, and, and what happened when you were abducted? Well in 74 um, I was due um, to be abducted at a place called Barnhill in Chinkra. How do you know you were due to be abducted? Well the craft came over um, Again, this is in, in looking back uh, on the information I now know. It was a, a program hardware. So it's one of their craft that came over. Uh, the idea was to abduct me there and then, even alongside a, another witness, another researcher friend at the time. At the last minute, just things were aborted. So, so you know. Um, Any reason? None given to me, none given to me. It's just listed on the files as a partial. Right. So how did you get involved with Peasmore? And what is Peasmore? Peasmore is an NSA stroke United States Air Force uh, secure installation. It's a subsurface base at Peasmore, underground. Why is it called Peasmore? I mean, we've been to the area, we yeah. can't find anywhere with the sign no, saying no. US secret base underneath. And a big arrow pointing down. Yeah. Mm. Uh, on all official documents, uh, Peasmore is the name they use. It's the closest village. I mean, the very edge of the base would be directly under, um, within two miles of, of, of the village of Peasmore. So where did the uh, NSA originally set the place up? They used, previous to Peasmore, they used a, another base, which unfortunately I'm not at liberty to say where that base is at the moment. I uh, have a schedule to keep to. Now, this is... What do you mean by a schedule to keep to? Keep to uh, well, as I say, I've been, yeah, I've been releasing this information for the past two years. Uh, it's information that uh, I've been asked to release. By who and by why, why you particularly? Um, well, again, why do they go to Tony Dodd or, or Mary Seal or Quest International? Why, why do they just send a nice fat envelope to Timothy Good or Tim somebody? Yeah. Well, they are using a number of researchers uh, here and, as I say, in the States same things happening over there. Um, the people who are assisting, who want to see this information got out, are a section of British intelligence. They are the defence intelligence section. 
the beady eye. The British, yeah. Now, they Why? got to a state, well they got to a stage I mean, where... They're violating the, uh, the, the various folders and all that sort of Oh, they're stuff. definitely breaking the Official Secrecy Act even by giving me information, passing information. But it's got to a stage when they realise that the NSA are literally going to take over the intelligence network, not only in this country, but virtually, in the end, the whole world. They so don't who runs the that. NSA? Is it the reptilians or what? No one knows. They're, they're this faceless uh, bunch of characters who are above the NSA. No one knows who they are. But certainly the NSA have got more than enough clout, so everyone... So the British defence people are getting a bit peeved off? That they're, they're getting worried. I mean, the programme diverted some years ago to a very sinister side when they were using spare parts from humans. They were abducting people. A lot of these people never saw the light of day again. They were used as spare parts. That's like the film Coma? Very like the film Coma. In fact, um, that sort of regional hospital policy where they get taken to a certain operating theatre, and that's, oh, that's the termination room. Well, think of that laterally, and that is what happens at Harwell and Peasmore. Various individuals are abducted, taken there, they never come out again. They're used as nice, healthy specimens. Again, are they genetically selected for any particular reason, or are we just dealing with a relatively random cat? It, in the beginning, it was just, yeah, a random thing. I mean, any anyone would do. I mean, obviously, we can get a number of good spare parts from this person, all well and good. But Maybe. then they started to get very fussy. The only grey, now if we use the term grey as a, an alien being, was those that actually were around the base at the time. Right. At the so base how, many, how many are you talking about greys at Peasmore then? I've only seen two greys at Peasmore. Right. The rest, what did they look like? Well, the typical picture everyone gives. Very small, very frail, large heads, very dark, wrap-around eyes. And were they escorted by military personnel? Escorted by military and NSA personnel. And were there any reptilians in there? On not? one occasion I did see, yes. A, what I would call reptilian, certainly so how a very different are they to the grey? Totally different. These are much bigger, much stronger. They gave an aura of yeah, strength and power, as if you, you don't mix with these so sort of are characters. So these as big as a man or bigger? Or? Certainly bigger than a good six inches taller than me. So well, well over six foot. Yeah. 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 So um, what are they? Look like, talk like. I mean, did you get any kind of no communication at all? No. Um, again, under what, such, under, under what circumstances did you see this? Well, I think that it was more like a, a case of they could just walk around there as if they owned the place. That was just the assumption. So they were not escorted. The reptilians were not escorted. The, the reptilians, although obviously everyone in the base is, let's use the word loosely, escorted. But I think it was more a case of the reptilians were escorted the NSA personnel around the base. And. Uh, that's it for set for Sea City. Suffolk, England. Uh, in a previous interview, Barry, you mentioned seeing a lizard like creature at Peasmore. Would you uh, tell us more about that? Yeah, on one occasion, it was just a, a single occasion. I was in the main corridor at the base and coming out of the room along the main corridor was this very large creature, very tall, well over six foot. Um, being accompanied by two uh, men in suits, which I took to be NSA operatives, they're the only ones who don't wear badges in the place. Uh, I just stopped in my tracks, very, very uh, shaken. I mean, it's a very powerful looking uh, being, very difficult to describe, just very, very tall, very well built, very strong. Well over, as I say, well over six foot. It must have towered at least a foot over my my head. Uh, a greeny browny mottled uh, type of skin. I tried to take in as many details as possible, but as I say, it literally caught me unawares. I was really put into shock. Didn't know what the hell it was. It was just casually walking along main corridor with the two operatives. Got a very strong sense of evil and nastiness about the thing. Um, it worried me for quite a while afterwards. I mean, you know, you're never told. The security people are last to be told what's going on. But it was inferred by others at the time that that was one of the reptile species. 
of course it didn't mean that much to me at the time but every time you asked questions no one wanted to answer it was just strongly inferred that yeah that was a reptilian you don't want to mess with that and it was just left at that but over the years it's it just seems more and more plausible to me that that also was another creation from the base it just you know there, there may well be reptilian races but it's just as easy for the military to have actually made this thing rather than it being an actual like the rest of them like the rest of them yeah it, it's it i sit more happier with that but yeah that was actually made rather than an actual species yeah. but it was a program generated live for i'm pretty certain it was yeah yeah uh, did he make sounds or say anything no he never looked at me it just continued walking there was no interaction whatsoever um i only, I only got some interaction from the two guys who that I'm standing there mouth wide open gaping at this and I just got the look from them just uh, you know and they just continued and I continued about my business you know, there's no sound uh, no speaking no nothing whatsoever it was just walking along the main corridor with the two guys that was it did you have any idea what his function was um... well again you ask as many questions as as you formulate afterwards once you've got over the initial shock of what the hell was that no one wanted to know, uh, no one wanted to easily give answers to questions. It was a case of, well, you saw it, that was it, you know, don't ask questions. Troublemakers ask questions and they don't want them. He was walking on two feet, was he, or four feet, or? Two, yeah, two so feet. I was standing upright. I mean, as I say, I'm trying to take in, this all happened probably within 30 seconds. I'm taking it in, uh, feeling, you know, whew, yeah, I don't want to meet this on a dark night anywhere. Um, yeah, I never even bothered to look back, it was, well, the glance back I gave both the, the, the figure and the two, two guys was, was very brief. While I continued, that's it, I've got jobs to do, I'm away, that's not my business. But over a period of time you were there for uh, upwards of a year or so altogether, why did this one bit 30 seconds, why did this brief... Because it was so out of place with what was going on there, I mean, everyone's so used to the, the three different phases. You know, of development of the PGs, and this literally stuck out like a sore thumb. You know, it's just not the usual thing you see around. It was just the once, once only. Um, yeah, it was very unnerving, yeah, very scary. Any final questions? You didn't see an insignia or anything on his clothing. I mean, he was dressed in something, uh, presumably. If it was, again, I never noticed. Uh, I didn't discern. You know, oh, that was skin, and that was clothing. It, it, that just didn't, that wasn't there. It was just this tall being. I mean, mostly my focus was from, you know, chest upwards, I mean, the head. You know, it was, yeah. I was literally expecting it to turn around and face me. Then I wouldn't know what I would have done if it had done, but it just kept looking straight and continuing as if I wasn't even there. So, no, I didn't take in that many details. Uh, what I saw was, yeah, quite enough, thanks very much. Is there anything that you could, that you could say it looked like? Uh... Well, again, you've seen drawings that people have done over the years of supposed uh, reptilians, Draco, whatever they, you know, the, the names are given. It, it lizard-like. I mean, it literally is like a very tall, very big lizard. I mean, you know, I was half expecting the big forked tongue to come out, but you know, again, it's just what you expect, what you're programmed to expect a, a lizard-type being to be like. Any idea why they would create such a creature? Well, it's exactly the same like the, the, the normal, if you can call them that, PGs. I mean, they're there for military abductions. And there's a, a, an awe of mystery over the reptilians. They're the dangerous ones. They're the ones who are in charge. Uh, they're just continuing that. Yeah. Anything, finally, that you would like to say to um, the C-SETI group? Well, as I Any mentioned... Any word of advice on it? Well, there is. I mean, there's, there's insiders out there who probably know a hell of a lot more than I'll ever know. And there's a lot of people out there who want to come forward. Just give them the reassurances that they'll be listened to without being laughed at. They'll come forward. Can you help in that regard? Well, it's limited to what I can personally do. I mean, I can only help with people over on this side of the Atlantic. And I know there's a Absolutely, load of people yeah, locally, yeah. Yeah, who are involved. And by making my documents known, they know that I was involved. It might make me a little bit safer in coming forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We certainly appreciate your time and 
efforts. Okay. You mentioned something about a trip seat in the body. Yeah, there room. is uh, an area of the base called the, the labs and electronic areas. Uh, situated in the labs are devices which are called trip seats. Now these are very large chairs connected to very advanced computer systems and uh, a guinea pig is strapped to this chair you are interfacing directly with the computers during this interfacing the individual is then programmed by the personnel at the base to literally do whatever they want you to do it's advanced psychotronics so how is this programming take place and what does it involve uh, again depending on what tasks they want that individual to perform at some stage I mean it's if you've seen the film Telephone, a 1977 film, um, sleeper agents, for want of a better term, were activated by a simple uh, single telephone call. They were given a phrase over the telephone, immediately the or post... assassination? Or? I, I suppose they could be used for that, although they, I don't really see why there'd be such a, a need. When so what exactly was involved with the trip scene? Well, as I say, it was basically programming. You could be programmed to do... I mean, how did this happen? Say, was it a visual image? Or? Yeah, you've got, on the trip seat, as I say, you're interfacing with the computers. You've got a very big wraparound screen in front of you. This is holographic. You're yeah. also um, a special helmet and visor placed on your head. So literally all images, subliminal images, are come through. Uh, they use the EBL. What's that? Uh, electronic brain link. On the what does that involve? Well, that involves the images directly being converted from the computers into images acceptable by the brain. They're implanted, they're held there until activated at a later time by... So is this a direct electrical connection to, to, your, to your mind? or you're dire you're, You are connected directly to the sea which, as I say, comes through the computer. So, yeah, you're interfacing. Literally, it's man and machine as one. So is there any psychic use for this? Or? They use mostly psychics there. Um, they enhance anyone with any level of psychic ability. If they can make use of that. I mean, uh, the military use people for remote viewing um, targets in military installations in other countries. So anyone with a any trace of psychic ability in them, yeah, they'll enhance that considerably. PK, a remote viewing, and a number of other bits and pieces. So are they able to see what you're seeing in your head, or is it just a one-way thing and into you? Um, they can't actually see, not, not visually uh, see what you're seeing. They just know what they're pumping through to you, so they, they virtually know what's happening anyway. So, so how do they know that you... Well, so they give simple tasks first, like, say... Um, two days after being in the trip seat then they'll set you a task and if you can uh, perform that task 100% they know it's worked and then they can actually program more sophisticated tasks for you at a later date. What sort of things did they use on you? Um, basically the first thing was to erase once everything had gone in was to um, erase from my conscious memory everything about the base. So come January of 80, when they brain scrambled me, for want of a better term, it was a, an erasure job uh, done on me, but they knew at some stage that someone would be able to retrieve certain I mean, parts. I mean, obviously you're talking about this now, uh, 16 years later. Uh, how is it that you're able to even talk about it or discuss it? Well, during 1988, uh, I underwent a truck stop event. This is where the Defence Intelligence people came into the scene, 1988. Because they've, they've got access to exactly the same techniques used by the programme at Peasemore, they brought me out of the uh, post-hypnotic blocks. So they reversed the process? They reversed the process virtually, gave back a lot of the information. There's still a lot blocked. But they decided that, yeah, they'll reverse as much as suited them for information to be released. So, yeah, I got a lot of conscious recall after they reversed the situation. 
and they've sort of filled in so many gaps since. So Bits and pieces what? of. Um, well, physically, um, going back to the base. Um, which entrance did you use to get into the base? Bravo, mainly. That's Green and Common. Green and Common. Which we were there recently. Now that's through one of the large hangars. Yeah. Or the the underground um, bunkers, rather. Yeah. That's it. So, what other things did they do to and, and how, how did that? How was that involved? Did they do that in the in the truck when you had the truck, or did they take you somewhere else? And well, what, well, the truck stop event. I mean. Um, I was, because I was, I was still under the control of the electronic brain link, so and DIA having access to exactly the same So sort of how did that equipment. work? How, how are you under the control of the brain link? Uh, well that's where that... Um, the implant? The implant comes in, yeah. I mean, as I say, you're, you're tracked. So how does this happen? Um, is it through? Not too, I'm not too up on the technical right, side of things, yeah. but obviously the, the equipment is there, they can use it, they can track someone, they can bunk, uh, they can monitor the biological functions and they can, yeah, literally there and then. Right. And they diverted my truck to um, a small lay-by whereby I was then dragged out of the truck, bundled into the back of the van, and it was a, a process of, yeah, virtually reversing the initial process it was um, So why have they done this? Why did they suddenly decide to reverse the process? So you could tell us what's going on in, in the base? They needed someone. Um, as I say, I think they saw it as to suit their purposes. They needed someone to start getting some information out. And at that time were you involved with London UFO Studies? Or had any 1988, no it wasn't, no. No, I was... Um, so it was after that event? Oh, it was after that. So yeah. were there any other events uh, like that which happened afterwards? Was that just a one-off or what? Well, that truck stop in 88, um, it was a case of information was then given to me, which included a lot of photographs, maps, codes. I was to hide that documentation and, and retrieve it at a later time. So that's again. maps and codes and photographs? Maps, codes, photographs of the base. Um, Who took the photographs? They did. Defence people. So we, I found later that you tried to retrieve those photographs? I tried to retrieve those on two occasions. In 1995? Uh, 1994. Um, I tried to retrieve them in, uh, I think it's November. And where did you keep them that you needed they were to retrieve? kept at a firm of solicitors, which I thought was a... Um, I thought it was a pretty clever move, thinking, well, no one would actually even think of looking. But uh, the, the uh, Peasemore personnel obviously knew every move I was making before I even made it. So it turns out that you tried to recover those documents and photographs. On and, two occasions, and yeah. And what happened? Well, the first occasion, uh, I was stopped on my way into town to pick up the documentation. And two guys in a, in a white car. Um, physically prevented me from, you know, they knew I, where I was going, what I was doing, so it was a case of, you know. So how is it that you were given information to release? Well, to say, I'm one... tried to release it, uh, somebody else says no. Um, there implies there is a conflict there. Well, obviously there's a conflict there. I mean, you've got uh, a, a small band of uh, British intelligence people up against the whole organisation, the NSA, so obviously... Yeah. Even though it would suit the purposes of British intelligence to get this information out, it obviously doesn't suit the purpose so is there of the NSA. a possibility NSA. of that happening again in the future? Well, there's no chance now of because even trying to retrieve all because they've been removed from the yeah. premises. So but in, in terms of new information, maybe actual video of the place? Because that's what we need nowadays. It's video footage of that the would be chambers. Yeah, that would be the cream on the, on the cake, would be to, to try and get some visuals actually of the base, but to actually... Right. Do you think you've anything over there? Your your ring's detecting things, is it? Oh, the ring ain't, but I am. Such as what? Oh, well, someone's having a good snoop with some oh, binoculars or something over there somewhere. Right. To get back to um, what the NSA did and uh, the influence that they had. 
Well, it's a global thing, really. I mean, the operation that's taking place over here is tiny compared to what's happening in the States. Obviously, the same thing is happening over there, but on a much bigger scale. Well, what's, what's happening here in England, in the, in the English bases and the British bases here in England? We've talked about Peasmore. Uh, what exactly goes on in Peasmore, and what's the situation there? Well, the programme, with the help of alien technology, have created their own life forms. Their own little greys, really, if you like. Right. Are they derived from uh, grey DNA? Yeah. With the technology that we've gained, obviously, since um, experimentation since the Second World War. So, combined, so, yeah. During the Second World War, they, we were already involved with greys, is that what you're saying? Uh, at the latter stages of the Second World War, yeah. So that was that Hitler or was it us? Both. Although... So um, you're saying that the, uh, during it, the Second World War we were dealing with genetic engineering at, a, at an elementary level with grey aliens? The Germans were ahead of us with the experimentation, but certainly both sides, Allied and Axis, were... So how do you base that criteria? On the information I was shown. At Peasmore. At Peasmore and one of two other locations, yeah. So in many regards you're sort of like an English Bob Lazar. You've been presented with information in a, in a base and... Do you think so? There are similarities, but I don't claim to have um, had any physical um, occasions with the machinery whatsoever. I mean, a lowly security guard, if you like. So what other activity that happened there as such? Well, as I say, they've got their own created life forms. Yeah, um, the programmable, the PGLFs. The PGLFs, so... And how many of them are there there, and what sort of quantity are, de are we dealing with? I would imagine hundreds, I mean, of each. So how many they're, they're did in you three see? stages. Right. The, the tiny uh, fetus-like uh, stage ones. And how, how are they generated? The actual mechanics behind that, I don't know. Right. I mean, as a security guard... So what did you see as such? Uh, they're, they're in, like, racks or pods, if you like. Yeah. Um, and there's row upon row of each of the three stages. Stage two and three use the same type of large rack. Yeah. And they're in certain pods. And there's obviously row and row and row on each level. Um, each what sort of size of container are we dealing with? Uh, the larger racks are about 40 foot long, 6 foot by 4 foot or thereabouts. Is this in some kind of a clinical ward or factory type environment? Or? Oh no, well, you know, it's more like a warehouse. I mean, literally they are stores. They call them the racks, the sheds. Yeah. And that's, you know, row after row these things are just stored there for use. These things are alive, obviously, yeah. but they're in a sleep state or...? Um, I mean, you mentioned before that you could actually walk up to them and you'd see an expression on them. Was that the human ones? Um, because they're, they're programmed directly from the central computer systems, literally anything that goes in, they, yeah. they, they're programmed to go and do. They haven't literally minds of their own as such, but you, you, you can get something out of them. I mean... In what way? Well, it was a bit of a standing joke between the four British um, security guards there, but there was something strange about the faces of these little creatures, and uh, two of them were joking one afternoon and saying, well look, you get a screwdriver and you just carefully prise off this black thing on his face. Right, so there are, you're, you can walk up to them and you can touch them? Well, you can pick one up, you yeah. literally shove it over your shoulder, they're so small and light, but very, very strong. You know, they, they are very, very strong. Very, um, yeah, you could literally, yeah, go and pick one up. So they're in sort of a, a stupor, a coma type status? Uh, stupor, yeah, stupor. Not, not a coma, because literally, um, once the programming starts, whoosh, off they go and do whatever they've got to go and, and do, you know, what they've been programmed to do, so... I don't really know how you can describe the state they're in. They're just, you know, they're just suddenly, like automatons, they're switched on and off. And are there human derivatives of these? Oh, yeah. And what are they like? Um, 
well this is the the two that they used at Barnhill in Chingford in 74 totally different to the small grey like ones um, one was about six foot tall completely featureless had a a face as such but no eyes mouth nose none of that yeah very very long hair so that was a close what to sort of hair, colour of hair do they have? blonde, that was blonde. blonde hair and the second one was again about human size but completely featureless no uh, discernible features whatsoever they also have a... so a you're talking sort of a perfect human or just a non-event of a human? well basically just a... like a mannequin? is that what it's called project mannequin? Oh, that's a different story altogether. That um, I mean, that so, was a so play these on beings words. are not to do with mannequin. It's nothing. Mannequin is a project, but, but it's not what these, what this is, what these creatures are. No, they're not mannequins. Um, no, uh, in terms of the project name. No, the project name was devised. I mean, it was changed. At first, it was called Puppet Master. That was the name of the first project. It went into mannequin. So when did Puppet Master start? Uh, about 58 in the States. The idea, because again they play on words, like most codes they use in any project gives you an insight into what the project really is about. So Puppet Master, uh, Masters and Slaves. Yes. They were pulling the strings, literally. Yeah. Play on words. Yeah. I just change puppy So we have the first mannequin. type of, of grey, which we're manufacturing and breeding in, in peas more. What's the second stage? Um, after the, the tinies, the tiddlers, yeah. we get to stage two, which I suppose if you relate the PGs to humans, you'd have the baby, you'd have the teenager, then you'd have the adult. Right. Stage two is the teenager. What sort of age does it do? how long does it take for these things to come to, to be generated well that's that quite time? rapid that's that's a very strange thing about it between stages one and three there's barely months so between the time of uh when i first started working there in august september of 79 so by december i was already seeing from what used to be stage one that's walking man stage three so very short period of time so you were there for a very brief period of time. What, what, what I was actually a security officer. Obviously, I still had connections on and off between uh, December '79 and beginning of '81. So right. there was still some connection with them. So you brought in there as a security officer just to simply get you on the base, or would you do, 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 do you did a, a nine till five or a five hour week job or whatever? Uh, no, I was. Actually, just before being taken into Peasemore to work as a security officer, I was with a security company working in Simoncester, uh, Garders. I don't know if I should actually say that, but I have right. um, As your, your plain, ordinary uh, patrol officer. I manoeuvred um, Loss of contract by Garders meant Garders moved out of Simon Sister very quickly, and within a week, I found myself working at Peasemont. So it was all manoeuvred very, very quickly, very yeah. conveniently, very smoothly, no problems at all. So, with the, what happens with these beings, which are, what are they called? Program generated life forms, or PG tips, as the four of us used to refer them to, and they're used for the military abductions. They are your greys. They are what the witnesses see, the abductees see. They see and what these. happens to the people who are abducted? Well, they're taken in. Well, if they're abducted from their home or a car in the field, then using the, pro the program's hardware plus the PGs, a total abduction scenario will take place. Or they can be taken from their homes, their vehicles, if they're out in the open. They can get taken to the base, and an abduction will take place in the trip scene. So they are induced into thinking they're being abducted by aliens. So oh, yeah. what's this to say that these aliens are actually alien? Or not just some kind of human derivative? Well, obviously, there are real aliens. Well, 
why is it so obvious? I mean, if the government is manufacturing I these things, I don't think. Well, I don't think it's within, within the powers. I don't, well, sheer numbers of reported abductions. I don't think. So not all of the abductions are done by the government, then. Oh no, no, I don't think that would be possible. Also, some of the more flamboyant, some of the more exoteric um, features that some of the abductees come out with, like going through walls. Various. Is that really not induced out. in the trip seat as a dream that they're going to the wall? I've or? never known that. No, mm. no, no. So that seems a bit too advanced for a military so abduction. What, what sort of scale are we dealing with in the trip seat? Well, how many of them? How many people would be going through them? I know there's at least a hundred thousand programmed individuals right. at the moment. Yeah. So there's going to be quite a large percentage that would have gone through that trip seat procedure. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've been discussing the um, PGLFs, mm -hmm. the three stages that are involved the three with these. Three stages, yeah. And these are definitely alien. Well, they're derived from an alien technology, certainly, and they look more alien than humans, yeah. So what exactly do they look like? What sort of skin do they have? What sort of other uh, features do they have? Well, their skin, it's to the touch. I mean, it's it's not not clammy, as some believe. Is it warm? Very dry, very dry. dry? Scaly? Mm, not really. It's like, you know, parchment paper. It's a little bit rough, but I don't know. How many Did fingers do they have? Ah, well, they're, some have got four fingers and a thumb. They always have a thumb. Some have got three fingers and a thumb. Right. It, it literally does depend on what they're going to be used for. So they manufacture them um, according to specifications? Yeah. I mentioned earlier about uh, this seems to have started, this, this, this breeding program seems to have started during the war, during the latter stage war and the Germans and the Americans and British were involved with that? Is that yeah, right? well I think the Germans, as I said, were more advanced than the Americans were. So how do you know that? Where did you get that information from? Information shown to me. Uh, I've been shown a, a lot of documentation, films, slides, files, a lot of information I was told to um, release. Right. At so, certain stages. So what sort of films and slides are you dealing with? Or files? A lot of it's uh, gun camera stuff. So I've seen discs, alien life forms. What kind of alien life forms? Some really weird. Um, Humanoid? Well, they've been the typical grey. Um, creatures that perhaps look more like us, what they, I suppose you would call Nordics. Yeah. And some that you wouldn't even realise were life forms at all, unless you were told they were life forms. Well, what does that mean? Were they sort of like? We got some that appear to be like giant crystals that right. communicate. Yeah. Crystals. Weird. I mean, that's a weird thing. Oh, there's a there's a lot of weird things out Is there. Is he dealing with crystal entities? Well, they just appear to look like big blocks of crystal. I mean, shine. Um, and what do they contain? Some kind of an intelligence or what? Oh, we've asked intelligence. I mean, they just look like a big, like a big prism. Right. And where are these situated or located? Well, on the, on the films, um, let's say various shots, uh, sun gun camera shots. And you were shown this film at Peasmore? Oh, no. no. So where were you shown this information? Uh, so, well, I, I underwent two or three interviews with the MOD. Yeah. Um, what sort of interviews were these? Well, very casual, very friendly, very chummy type of interviews. And when did that happen? Uh, 1978 was the first, March 1978 was the first interview. Yes. And where did that take place? At an unspecified location in London. Basically, at Queen Anne's Gate or some place like that. Some place like that, yeah, yeah. And uh, you were hauled in, dragged in. Somebody phoned you up and said, "Hey, Barry, come in. We wanted to oh, show no, you some no. films on aliens." Um, to 
cut a long story short, I was driving home from a friend's house late at night. I stopped to give a, a lift to a, a very well-to-do looking gentleman who stuck out like a sore thumb, hitching a lift. Where is this, in London? Uh, in Leightonstone, yeah. So there's obviously not many well-to-do people in Leightonstone? Uh, well, I wouldn't have you would have seen too many city gent types on right. the lift at about half eleven at night. Yeah. Right. Unless he was out like, tidying for business or something. Well, obviously yeah. I thought well, he's had trouble with his car somewhere. Yeah. So what happened then? I uh, stopped. He uh, opened the car door, stuck his head in. Well, oh, thanks for stopping, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, get in, fucking help. And uh, started to drive away. I noticed because, of, uh, again, it's near Whips Cross Hospital, not too much traffic that time of night. Yeah. There was a car parked on the other side of the road facing the other way, yeah. lights out, um, I started to drive away, immediately um, I was offered a, a cigarette by this gentleman, a yeah. strange type of cigarette, it was um, a brown, cigar? long thin, well, well in between a, a, a cigarette and a cigar, Yeah. immediately I lit that up, Noticed that the car that had been parked over on the grass verge to my right yeah. came onto the road, came behind me. I immediately felt a bit strange, uh, woozy, lightheaded. So it was drugged in some way, so they got uh, you. Well, I immediately remember the wheel, steering wheel, being pulled sharply to the left, and then from, on, from then onwards, very disjointed. You know, I don't remember right. very much at all. So you were then taken to a building of unspecified location. Well, I then remember driving actually in central London itself, um, being directed to an underground car park, told to park the car in a certain location, taken up in the lift, led along a corridor into a big main office, yeah. then through into a small office, and the uh, interview took place. And that, you were shown files? Shown, shown files. What uh, sort of files? What, what sort of volume of file are you dealing with? Um, well, it was a very quick procedure, you know. Yeah. Look at that, look at Pictures, that. Look at this, Pictures, information. Names, locations. What sort of names? Civilian and military names. I, I, I was told to take in as much detail as I could and to remember certain names and watch out for these names sometime in the future. Have you pu published those names in the voice documents? Some of them have been so far. Some I've yet to do, yeah, at the right yeah. time. Yeah. So what generally are we talking about here? Uh, what general theme are we getting? We seem to be in... We, we have the NSA, Hitler. Or, or the British, uh, were the British involved with this, this generation of aliens in the 1940s? Oh, yeah, the British have always worked very closely with the Americans, yeah. I mean, everyone bans about this new world order. Yeah. Business. Well, basically, yes, that's, that's the big agenda everyone's working for, but not everyone's got the right idea. Right. So what's the general reason for this? Or can you be more specific? Well, I'll be as specific as I, as I can. The idea is to have, let's have, let's call them the elite. Again, another strange little title, but let's call them the, the elite. Or the Illuminati. The in charge of everyone. The Illuminati, a, or...? I think they're all part and parcel of this whole package. Whatever. Those yeah. that are going to be in charge of the whole thing. Yeah. So we're going to have a masters and slaves situation. If we can have a nice, docile, manipulated public throughout the world, yeah. run by the masters, right. those in charge, yeah. and if, if we're not going to cause any ripples, they're not going to have any problems, and they can bring in literally anything they want to. We're looking for a stabilised population on the planet. They are depopulating the planet by various... We were going on to other tangents. AIDS there. and all that sort of stuff, manufactured diseases. Manufactured diseases, Wars. created catastrophes. Weather, weather warfare, earthquakes, all that sort of stuff. I think that all comes into it. It's all yeah. been hinted at very strongly that, yeah, there are direct plans to depopulate planet Earth. It's got to get to a stable number of... Uh, what sort of number? Do you have any idea? No. Just that there's far too many at the moment, and the way we're going, we're heading for right. serious problems. So what's so the idea is to manufacture these 
alien creatures? Well, again, it's the cover story. Uh, military abductions to give a cover story that we're really being invaded by hideous, nasty aliens who are only here to cause us harm. So that would support the idea that these aliens that you saw at Peasemore aren't alien, but they're some t kind of deviant human that we've been manufacturing? Is it would so? appear that way, but totally different. It's like chalk and cheese. The, the programmed life forms are totally different from the, let's bracket, real aliens. Right. So you, you've seen real aliens real at Peasemore? Real aliens Peasemore. compared to the PGs, totally different. So what are the real aliens like? Well, again, small compared to human standards, very frail looking. The eyes are totally different for a start. I mean, everyone's describing the yeah. large almond-shaped eyes, and that's true of the, the so ones So what's the seen. skin like? What are the nose like? What are the features like? Yeah, well, again, that's different. I, mean, I think they've tried to perfect the PGs to get as close as possible to the real aliens. Are the real aliens themselves slaves? Again, I, I seem to think that they're more in charge than the NSA are. They seem to give the impression that, you know, they can do what they want, and if we don't toe the line, we, you know, it's tough for us. Yeah. So that we've got greys walking about in the Asunderground facility in Peasmore, and who else is reptilian? Again, I saw just the one reptilian, and it would also give the impression... what kind of features did he have? Sorry? What kind of features did the reptilian have? Well, it again, gave the, the impression of being very strong, very powerful. Uh, what, what's, it's difficult to what describe. What sort of clothing did these guys wear? Did they have a weapon on board? Did they, did they, like a ray gun? But what would you know what would be a weapon? Someone so advanced. I mean, some people have seen this rod that they, that they have. Did they, what, did they, what sort of symbols did they have on their, on their No tuning? symbols noticed. Uh, clothing, I mean, I think you'd be hard pushed to differentiate between the skin, if you can call it skin, of this thing and any clothing it would have worn. It just be, it all just seemed to be all one. Right. No distinctive armbands or, you know, right. whatever. Right. And certainly no weapons detectable, I mean. So that's what you saw at Peasemore in the late 70s? Mm. And were you able to communicate with these things, or were you allowed to, or? A, I wouldn't have known where to begin, but I was told that the greys could certainly pick up um, faults. Right. So you were told quietly to perhaps don't think of certain things because yeah, you know, your faults could be picked up. So well, that's easier said than done. I mean, right. you know, you can't control your thought processes. What about uh, the, uh, the, the 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 reptilian lizard man? Well, then again, uh, well, the I mean, would he look like a lizard man or a lizard man? I wouldn't more? say it. Isn't it? Uh, no, I wouldn't say anything looked anything like a lizard at all, no. Uh, it was difficult to try and describe what sort of reptile I thought it looked like. I mean, I mean to what, be honest, I've never seen anything What would make like them it. look like a reptile to call them reptilian? I think the eyes, more than anything. Like I mean, cats? Cat's eyes? Vertical slit? Well, the vertical, stuff. yeah. yeah. Um, odd, just very, very odd. I mean, you, you, you heard rumours from other guards that it had a, like a, a snake's tongue. You know, right. And I th well, I haven't seen it, so I couldn't say, but right. lots of rumours fly around as well. So how is Peasemore accessed, and how is it connected to other facilities here in Britain? It's accessed through three major establishments, Harwell, Greenham Common and Watchfield, by underground uh, What's link. specifically at these three locations? What's uh, Greenham Common obviously is the place where they stored cruise missiles in the 80s and uh, now I've... And that was a damn of... good cover then, yeah. Um, well obviously that, that entrance is still going to be there. At uh, Harwell you can... That's where the civilian Rutherford and Appleton are. That's where the surveys run from. You access the... That's the survey which is the... World Genetic Survey. Yeah, yeah. Now you access that through a, a lift. The same with the uh, military um, place at Watchfield. That's accessed through a lift. So it's really only green and common that it's through the underground bunker. So what about the other place at Watchfield? <sighs> that also you go down. What, what uh, precisely at Watchfield? 
what that we're looking for. Well, that's the Royal Science uh, Laboratories at Watchfield. Uh, Is that a civilian or a army? No, it's military. Military. Yeah. So these three places uh, converge into this place called Peasmore. Yeah. What about Foley? Is it South Foley that the South Anna's Foley. Um, I've been told to let just a little bit of information out that South Foley is used by the NSA directly. That's their sort of... Is it still used today, in 1996? I'm, I'm told, yeah, I'm told so, yeah. That's their sort of London area um, base. Although base perhaps is the wrong word, but certainly yeah. that's, you know, they use that. So you mentioned in, uh, before that uh, these embryos are flown out in rabbits' wombs from Boscombe Down and all those sort of places. What other bases outside the general Peasmore area are connected with this program? Oh, quite a few. I've listed in, um, I think it's number 14 of my documents. I've listed all the underground installations in the UK. Now, a number of those are connected to the program and the survey. Not all. Such as what? Can you mention any? Uh, safely mention. Boscombe Down? Boscombe Down, obviously, yeah, because that's where the hardware is. What about uh, RAF Macrahanish? Macrahanish is used again for the NATO Firefly craft, you know, one of the hardware. We're here at Bentwaters. What's this facility here got? Uh, to do with the facilities that you're talking about? Um, here, they've got a, a large underground system. This is obviously the place in 1980 where Larry Warren was at, where the um, UFO events happened for three, for three days. That's right, yep. Over December 1980. Something definitely strange happened here. But uh, there's a very large underground complex here. I've been told he's on a, a, a non-full-use status, so I couldn't actually say what may or may not be going on here. But is this connected with the, um, with the Mannequin project or any, or, uh, or any of the, the other projects? Not as far as I know, no. But there is a possibility, because they use a number of underground um, installations to store the uh, PGs anyway. And this so is obviously the site where something happened uh, a while back and m m the military is meant to have had contact with the um, aliens. Well, they certainly had contact with something, yeah. What sort of size of facility are we dealing with at Peacemore? Well, as I say, that's, if we go by the 1979 time scale, 450 yards by 650 yards, deepest point around about a mile but I was informed sometime after that work was taking place there so they could have doubled that size easy no right. problem at all. So they're running these these creatures out and shipping them in rabbits to the United States but they might do the, it's the genetic labs are they manufacturing them at Peasmore and sending them out to Alabama? Is that what you mentioned earlier? Ah, oh, Alabama, yeah, that's... Um, the whereabouts in Alabama? Do you know? You've got two locations in Alabama. Uh, I don't think... Well, everyone knows one of those locations. I'm not quite sure whether I should actually, at this stage, uh, mention the other location. Well, why not? Well, I haven't been given the go-ahead to release certain information on the American side yet, so perhaps... Well, what's the first place that has already been mentioned? <sighs> well, let's run through the list of the ones I know I've safely given out so far. Fort Dietrich, Edward Arsenal. Everyone keeps mentioning Mount Weather, but I've got that on the on the A list, but not an active list, so I really couldn't... Right. Comment on that. There's a small town, uh, Orman or Oron or some place like that. And is that a familiar uh, name? Small, na short name like that? No. No. Rudlow Manor. Ah, uh, I knew we'd get to that old chestnut, Rudlow Manor. Now, that's Listen. the main UFO place in this country. Now, obviously, I don't know 100% what they've got lurking underneath Rudlow Manor. 
I can only hint that perhaps that's one of the main storage points for the program hardware. What but, kind of hardware are we talking about? Well, we're talking about you know, our super machines. Oh no, the hardware itself, not the PGs. I don't think Rudlow has anything to do with the PGs at all. I think it's, they're more of the hardware, the, the craft. If you like. Right, or oh, the physical craft? Physical right. craft, yeah. yeah. But talking about physical craft, where else are the aliens kept, or are the alien craft kept in Britain? Uh, Boscombe Down, possibility of Rudlow Manor, as I said, it's a big, big question mark with that. Uh, Macron Hanish, certainly used. RAF Lehman. Where's that? Oh, that's up north. Is there a place in Kent as well? Uh, yeah, but in Kent, you're edging onto the um, DARPA territory. What's DARPA? That's, That's the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency. We work very closely with NASA. Now, they're heavily into anti-gravity machines. So that's where we make our man-made flying discs? Yeah, amongst other things. Like what? Um, well, so they're, they're heavily into anti-gravity. They're heavily into interdimensional. Uh, you know, the, the field... Getting more precisely down to what you know precisely and on your involvement with uh, things. At Peasemore, we've talked about the reptilians, we've talked about the uh, man, the alien, uh, the greys being made there. What kind of, pro you've mentioned Project Mannequin as well. What exactly is Project Mannequin all about? Project Mannequin is uh, the creation of uh, life forms, military abductions, uh, microchipping uh, on a mass scale. I mean, the NSA's aim is to virtually microchip everyone in this country alone. So you know the scale they're working at. I mean, it, the UK, the USA, Canada, anywhere. It's going to be a, a and mass. And what's, what's the purpose of that? We get back to the same old thing. Everyone, let's give it the old title everyone's used so far, uh, the New World Order, the One World Government. And, what, and what's the alien connection with that? I think at some stage in the past where we were working hand in hand with the, the aliens. They Has that were, stopped? I think it's got to a stage now where we've abused the technology they let us have. And it's a case now where they certainly don't trust us for reasons unknown to myself, we can't trust them. Uh, so there's very, a double cross happening? It's a double cross sort of situation. I don't think we can trust the aliens anymore. I mean, could we ever trust the aliens? And which aliens we did in are, the beginning. Well, which aliens are we dealing with specifically? Can you name any races or types or anything? I think the greys are the ones that we basically can't trust anymore. The reptilians, I'm not too sure about. You couldn't trust them to start with anyway? Strange characters, yeah. Um, and these, what about these blonde types? What about The Nordics. Them? Well, I think perhaps we shouldn't trust those, even though they seem to be the more trustworthy of, of them all. You know, they're giving messages of love and goodness and all the rest of it. So perhaps. are these directly involved with the NSA facilities here in England? The Nordics, no. The other two types, certainly, yeah. And that's the only two types you saw at Peasemore? Yeah, it's the only two types I know of, yeah, that were connected with Peasemore. Massive. I mean, I could only go, obviously, judging by the 79-81 time scale, it was very large then, so by now it's... So did you ship these things out in, in, in trucks or what? Well, you asked me that before. I never actually saw anything larger than, a, say, a 30 underweight van. So obviously, I mean, if these things are being bred there, I mean, where do they all go? I mean, if we, if we take cattle, it takes so many thousand of those. I mean, they, they take up space. So wh wh where do they all go? Stored at various locations. I mean, there, were, there came a time, um, let me see, the end of 1994, when word was going around that they had to start storing the PGs at a different location because they were having security problems at Peasemore. So they were looking what around... What sort of security problems were these? Too many people were coming out with information that, yeah, certain created life forms were being stored at a certain base in Berkshire. I.e. Peasemore. Peasemore. And damage limitation 
because it's very difficult to find fees more. There's nothing feasibly available or visible on top. So how can you prove or how can you back up what I cannot claims? prove, obviously, that there is anything of fees more at all. I can only relate what I know, what I saw, what I heard, and what I went through. Um, there's no physical proof, obviously. Um, yeah. I could just say, like, um, OK, everyone knows there is an installation at Groom Lake. But you can go and see it. You can go and see that, but you can't find S4, for example, yes. or Dolce, yeah. or one of a number of So other. essentially, the Peasmore facility is a, is a British or English version of Dulce. Virtually, yeah. Ultimately, you've been releasing these documents called The Voice. For what exactly got you to, to release those or make them and what well, do you hope to achieve with them? The ideal way to, to get this information out would be to document in stages all this information, uh, disseminate it amongst other researchers who then would redistribute to their friends and colleagues, eventually to get as many people to know about the information as possible. Well, it's reached a stage now when it's been, what, just over two years since the first document was produced. And we've seen elements of the content of these documents appear in certain popular television programmes. Again, yes, it's been very coincidental. Two separate incidents have occurred in the X-Files alone, which uh, directly mirror information I've released in these documents. Such as? Um, on one occasion, um, an X-Files episode, Paperclip, in season three. They showed what could only be described as the result of a, a huge American government survey of a database held, um, well, it's comprised of millions, probably, of individuals' medical data, going back to childhood, including their DNA. So the scene in X-Files for uh, the vast num on the underground cavern, where the, 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 that's real. The mountain site. Well, um, what about the Greys who are contained in, in the same facility? Is that real? That, does that? Well, again, very, very similar. They, they seem to mirror um, what I've actually tried to explain in these documents. And a second the sec example would have been um, in the manga X Files comic. Uh, one storyline in that was centred around what can only be described as a trip seat, their version where Scully, in this instance, was um, strapped to the trip seat and programmed, and she didn't know reality from non-reality. It was a very spooky thing to read. So if you've been stuck in this trip, trip seat, how do we know that anything, or anything you're saying is true? Good question. I mean, all this could be pure government disinformation. So what, how, how can we believe what you're saying? Is, is, what can you give us which would indicate that what Other you're saying... Other than the physical scars and my own memories, there's, there's nothing I can uh, give by way of proof at all. So we've tried to get the photographs. That's on two attempts and failed. So uh, the BDI have decided that you can't have those photographs anymore. I think it was way above those. The NSA so knew directly. What was in the photographs? If you're not able to release the, inf the photographs physically, what did those photographs um, show? A number of photographs. They showed uh, the base, uh, various areas of the base, the PG storage areas, uh, the main personnel at Peasmore. Um, and who were they? You had Robert Whitemore, who runs or Peasmore. ran Peasmore at that time? In 79 to 81, he certainly was in charge. I believe he certainly still is. Sam's, he's the head of security. Now, I'm going to be careful where I name some of these names now. Yeah. Uh, Pachowski, Hodge, and I'm not quite sure I should name the other individual who's connected with Portman Down. Why? Well, I've been told I would be open to libel should this particular individual stand up and say, well, no, I have nothing to do with such an organisation, such an installation and such a work. Right. But uh, everyone who's read the documents will know who I'm referring to. 
Right. But certainly uh, that particular person is directly connected with so the So you're talking project. about people who are involved, so involved with major government civilian uh, projects are directly involved with these? Civilian and military, yeah, yeah. Directly connected. Um, as I said, this last person's name uh, connected with Porton Down. Now, he, obviously, he can confirm or deny any knowledge of the Mannequin Project. He can confirm or deny any knowledge of Peasmore, but certainly his name is on the documentation. So, taking it from there, we have a project where the British government is involved or under the orders of the NSA to manufacture alien creatures and to also abduct human beings. And have them microchipped. Yeah. And have them microchipped. Are they involved with the genetic engineering as well? Are we, oh, are yeah, we that's generating crossbreeds? The two are running simultaneously, the survey and the project. So how are these creatures controlled? By a central computer. Yeah. And how, do that, how does that computer communicate with these beings, they're using the mind control transmission switch or yeah, transmitted? Yeah, it's very similar to the, the way they uh, control the microchip humans, is, yeah, the electronic brain link. And what is that precisely? Well, that's uh, an extremely low frequency setup, very powerful. The NSA can switch from Minwith Hill in uh, Yorkshire, which is the main uh, area for the running of the network in this country. Yes. In the United States there's two or three locations which I'm not aware of. So how does that piggyback, how does that communicate, how does that get to us all? Does it affect ordinary human beings as well? Uh, depending on the sensitivity of, of each individual, yes, yeah, certain people can pick up. I mean you get some people say they hear uh, strange buzzies, noises, ringing in the ears or whatever. It can affect a fairly close range, the uh, equilibrium of an individual. So you literally could get knocked off your feet with a very strong signal. Those are not microchipped. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, are you saying it paralyses you in such a way that you collapse, or it would depend on the sensitivity of the person. Certainly, someone, yeah, literally could, yeah, lose their balance. Yeah. Have you got heard cases of that, or I have known cases, yeah. What about the other four security guards that work with you? Are they, are they not able to communicate all this stuff out as well, or? Well, the other three British. Um, those three no longer work at Peasmore. I believe one is dead. I believe one was picked up uh, in the Midlands and one is on the run. The last I heard from him, Harry Reader. Um, I believe he's still in Holland. The last communication I got was in when he was in Amsterdam. And it is Why are they running? I mean, you're obviously not being pursued. We're standing here beside bent borders. I think I've got a base. slightly different situation to... Now, those other three individuals would have come straight out to the papers. They would have literally gone to the papers, where I'm not quite so stupid. Um, I'm trying to do it in a more subtle, subtle way of releasing the information. Harry Reader, for a start, was a, a bit of a, a troublemaker, and he, he definitely would have gone to the media first. And so he was deemed more of a threat than I am. So he was bumped off then? I believe, I believe he's still being chased around Amsterdam. So when did you last talk to him and what did you say? Was there anything important that, there, that you could relay? Yeah, last, last November uh, he phoned and uh, basically said that uh, he was skipping around Holland to keep out the way, warning me that the programme were trying to find other locations to store the PGs because they were worried that uh, storing them solely at Peasmore wasn't uh, a viable proposition anymore. Because you've broken the news of its existence? What, well, among others, yeah. And who else has broken the news? Well, there's a number of individuals over here which, if I name names, those individuals would then be placed in a position of danger and also personal trauma, so I can't name names. Right, can you name, give any rough details which would, which would allow us to figure out what sort of things they've been saying? Uh, certain individuals here and overseas have been hinting strongly at military abductions. They've been trying to 
give as much information on various underground installations in the United States that uh, deem worthy of some sort of investigation by researchers. It's re related to present day information or information at the time? Of in, in, well, it's going to be a mixture of both. The information I had first hand knowledge of, plus information past direct. So yeah, current day, it'll be right up to date. So this is a current project, it hasn't been shut down like oh, this base that we're it, standing It got beside. close to being shut down on a couple of occasions. Does it cost a lot of money? Uh, well, obviously, if it gets put on the back burner, yeah, there's uh, money lost everywhere, especially with this uh, genetic business, yeah. There was a lot, a lot of wastage? A, a lot of, yeah. A lot of so a lot of lost. people are dragged in there and uh, just trashed? Uh, a hell of a lot. I mean, if you can imagine... What kind of money, uh, what sort of quantity are you dealing with? Well, you're talking millions of dollars. You're talking about uh, the loss of, I mean, the... Uh, the spare part side, let's call it that, earns their millions per year. So if that revenue is lost, even for a few months, that's, that's some money. I mean, look how many kids go missing every year. Okay, individuals that go missing, in, in a, a majority of cases, there's a, a legitimate reason for them going missing, but there's a percentage that just get taken away. And they're used for breeding or for spare parts? Spare parts. Are these spare parts used for humans, or are they used for these? Yeah, they use yeah organ donation. Well, you say organ donations. Um, there's a very big market for organ transplantation these days. Those with more than enough money, who won't wait for the right organ to come along, will just buy into that market. The market's there. So that's a sideline to finance this, is that oh, right? Oh yeah. That's a nasty, sinister sideline they've got, and that's increased rapidly. It's got to proportion now. Well, it's hideous just to think about it. It's on such a... Because uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, dark goings-on run by NASA alone. Uh, it could go on for ages. So this again all seems to tie... And, uh, and this all again ties in with this slave race thing that they're manufacturing? Oh, yeah. Alien spacecraft. So, I mean, the alien spacecraft people are seeing aren't alien. They're ours. Uh, Is that what you're saying? Some are ours and some are... Obviously, there must be aliens. Otherwise, we're more clever than I thought and they're all military. Yeah. yeah. So, finally, um, let's base ourselves at Peasmore. Where, does, where is Peasmore connected to in the chain, physically, underground? Uh, uh, physically where, where? connected to Watchfield, Harwell, and Green and Common. And what facilities at Watchfield and Harwell? Uh, well, Harwell, it's uh, well, let's call it a disguise as a, an atomic energy commission type of research establishment. It's good cover. At Watchfield, it's the military, uh, it's a, a science academy of some sort. Is a good cover, and of course, Green and Common was used as the uh, one of the two main cruise missile bases. Molesworth being the other. And outside of that area, what other main facilities in Britain are we dealing with? Got to look closely at Porton Down, which they work very closely with Boscombe Down because they use that as the import-export area. Uh, that they they fly in the the embryos or fly them out or. But obviously that takes place also the hardware, mainly the hardware is flown in and out of the yeah. UK via Boscombe Down, but they also use Macron Hanish. Yeah, well that's a long way away. That's it is, but uh, again we edge on to that so-called Aurora project, it's all connected with the... What do you mean by the so-called Aurora project? And well, I think that's a, a, another uh, red herring that's been deliberately fed to researchers, give them a code word, give them Aurora, and they'll run themselves ragged trying to find out what Aurora is, and all the time it's uh, it's just another piece of program hardware. They're a very advanced one at that. And that is that got spaceflight capability or? Uh, I believe it's suborbital. But I think we're in all summary, for, for what do you think in is summary, this, for what's generally happening? Well, more and more military abductions are going to take place. More and more people are going to be microchipped. There's going to be more mind manipulation. 
on the citizens of the UK unless someone actually does something about it. I mean, it's all going to be done in such a subtle way. Um, this new about, world order business. You're talking about mass annihilation of the, civ the civilian population? It's not going to be an annihilation. It's going to be a case of we're all going to be under their control and we're not even going to know about it. Can you not say that that's what's happening now? Are we not under the control already? We still have uh, quite a lot of uh, free will. At the moment, once we're all microchipped, that's all gone.